So Tessa's going to be sort of, she is going to, I think, clear the mystery of the origins of the Cube uh, as, as, as a startup. But I've had the pleasure of working with Tessa for years, and it's been, she's one of the amazing people at WHO who really understands uh, development and has really uh, worked with people around the world to really strengthen their capacity and gain their ownership on things like the, on the various tools that WHO uh, has implemented. And she's also been the innovator. So with pleasure, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tessa Tentores. Thank you, Sharmila. Um, OK, so I, I'm starting the part on choosing services. That is one part of the cube. And I just want to say why. I just wanted to point out why we say universal health coverage. Every word of that means something. This is universal. This is health. And this is what has been talked about in terms of coverage. OK? It's all the three. And so we are now going to look at these services, which services are covered. Uh, so how does one choose needed services? And so we have a very broad choice, preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, palliative, across the life course, across different levels of health facilities. We can look at inputs from procedures, pharmaceuticals, and other medical goods, and then the one question, and, and I, I'm not a philosopher, I'm, a, I'm also not an economist. I'm a medical doctor. And so what I always keep on pushing is, uh, what does it actually mean when we have these very good discussions? And so one of the things that you talk about in terms of interventions that are covered is whether you talk about a positive list or a negative list, okay? And I think that's a very important thing to talk about. For me, coming from the cost-effectiveness world, as uh, Dean Frank said, uh, together with Dean started it, Dean, the other Dean, Dean, Dean Jamison started it, and he claimed I raised it to an art form. But I'm coming from the field of choice, which is choosing interventions that are cost-effective. And we look at cost-effectiveness to maximize health. And that means getting the most out of the available funding. And what I want to show is how, do you, how we want to try to quantify what are the opportunity costs when choosing less cost-effective uh, interventions if we, uh, if we start, um, if I make the claim that the best choice here is cost-effectiveness because it's here where you define the population, and it is here where you define the financial protection, okay? And so for me, my mandate when I'm here is to increase health. The distribution of health for me is here, and the financial protection is here, okay? So if I decide to deviate from the most cost-effective set of services here because of considerations in this side, no matter how you denominate it by whatever dimension, urban, rural, male, female, poor, uh, uh, worse off, or whatever. It's, it's here that we're talking about this, and this is about the financial protection. So I'm saying that for me, I can legitimately claim that my mandate can be, when I'm choosing services, the most cost-effective services. Okay, and if I choose to deviate from that because of considerations here and here, then I will have opportunity costs associated with a set of services which are not the most cost effective. So that's one thing I want to put out on the table. And remember, I'm talking here as Tess. I'm not talking here as WHO. And then I want to go a little into implementation issues. So this is, for example, so let's start with negative lists and positive lists. So OECD did a uh, survey in 2009 looking at their country. So there's a list of 29 countries which responded to the survey. The U.S. did not respond, okay? So here you can see here whether you have a positive list. This is for a definition of the benefit basket for medical procedures 
and this is for pharmaceuticals. And for example, Greece has this for, um, and I'm pointing at Greece because it's, uh, that's where we're seeing there, are, there is already an impact. They have had a 25% decrease in their budget in health because of the financial crisis. But over here, and is this right, they have a negative list. Is that right? I can't see it really. Uh, the benefit, ba oh, sorry, the benefit basket is not defined, okay? So, um, so there, there are differences. And if you recall what Dean Frank said in the very first day, for him, negative lists are pseudo-universal lists. So particularly, I think, I'm, I will also make the claim that for those countries with a very limit, with limited resources, a positive list is what you need in order to ensure that they can claim their entitlements. So which are the health services? So this is an example of countries, and this is the average, and this is by quintile, the lower quintile, the upper quintile. This is about 50 countries, and you can see that there is inequality within each country in terms of the quintile, in terms of percentage of births by medically trained persons, okay? And so I'm basically, you would want to be here, right? This particular country, whatever it is, you want very high coverage, and you don't want any discrimination across the quintile. So this is what we want, and I would say perhaps this is probably one of the things that you should have in your benefit package. How do you still further qualify the others? So these were the MDG tracer conditions, okay? What I'm saying is we don't start from zero. We have a history behind us of MDG. So I would say I would put in all of this, and then I would say additional as possible based on the burden, the cost effectiveness threshold, which is implied by this. So I will also make the assertion that any intervention that has a cost effectiveness threshold below this should be included in the package, especially if there is a major burden, okay? Which means it's something that needs to be addressed and subject to budget and logistical feasibility. But cost effectiveness is not that straightforward. And here we're saying, I think this point has been made before, cost effectiveness might correlate with the other axes, and sometimes it's good. So many cost effective interventions are for traditional diseases of the poor. And so you would want those to be covered because at the same time, you would have, uh, sorry, financial protection at the same time. But then you have the other one where you have, you might have to make choices where they are cost ineffective but they are costly and therefore they could inflict a financial burden and will cause catastrophic payments. So that, that, that is one uh, particular thing where you actually need to make a trade-off. Also remember, cost effectiveness may change. And this is, this is something which we can influence. I think uh, our friend from the NGO who made um, broader claims as to what should be done Many ART drugs started out as very expensive, but because of national global volume of sales, and particularly because of international pressure, they were able to drop it down. So before, ART was cost ineffective, but then it became cost effective because of, of the drop in the prices. It could also become cost effective because of bundling of services and you have a sharing of the fixed cost. So sometimes it's very hard to actually just, when we think about cost effectiveness, we should actually think not just of individual interventions, but the bundle of services being delivered. And then, and then we have the particular problem of startup costs, particularly for new interventions where there needs to be an investment and that the traditional cost effectiveness analysis, because it's already there for, inter for some interventions, will not include this. But then some interventions require capital infrastructure or development. And that builds up, that adds up to the cost. So it makes them relatively cost ineffective, whereas some interventions become cost effective because the infrastructure is already there. It becomes more effective it becomes more efficient to actually introduce the same types of interventions, okay? So it's just something that, that we should be very careful about. And sometimes, as we all know, even if cost-effective, it may not still be affordable. So what do we do? 
I'm saying if we start with the most cost effective, we would put together the choice results. Okay, these are our results, standardized techniques of cost effectiveness analysis of, a relative, of quite a broad range of interventions. And then we would uh, use quantitative techniques to explore concerns and illustrate the impact of alternative choices. So if you make alternative choices, you answer the question, what re resources will be released or foregone? What existing treatments will have to be displaced? What health benefits will be foregone? And what is society willing to pay for a more equitable choice of interventions compared to a more cost-effective choice? And so this is an example just looking at mental health. So if you have a mental health budget of $3.50 per capita, for example, efficiency results from choice suggest funding the following conditions, fully funding it, epilepsy, alcohol treatment, depression treatment. No funding would be allocated to treatment of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia on efficiency grounds alone. However, equity and priority setting considerations, and here we use the GPS, condition is severe, chronic, lifelong, not curable, limited capacity to benefit, bad luck in the health lottery. Interventions are the only means to help. So what happens? Uh, I will quickly go through this, but if you just did the most cost-effective set of interventions, this is it, you would stop essentially up to here, and you would exclude this, okay? And this is your cost-effectiveness ratio. And then if you decided to include schizophrenia, okay, uh, okay, schizophrenia, and uh, sorry, I can't see it from here. Uh, you would essentially have this particular set of results. So you take out the last two and you put in the new two interventions which you say should be in because of cost effect, uh, because of equity reasons, okay, like schizophrenia. And then you see that you actually um, have a increase in the average cost per DALI by 26% and you actually have a DALI loss per one million expenditure of about 20%. If you substituted the two interventions which are being inputted for equity reasons and you're taking out the two most cost effective. This is, this is just to illustrate, okay? And so then you ask the question, uh, is society willing to pay for this? Okay, and then finally implementation issues. We, there are already services being provided and we need to think about this and how to actually think about grafting in something which is new, okay? And then the administrative ease. Um, many, I, I just want to tell you the story of when we were in Indonesia, we had a group, we were going to work with the cost, uh, sorry, with insurance people there. They were first deciding their bundle of uh, package of services or their package of services. Then we had a group of people trained in clinical epidemiology coming in saying, well, this is the set of essential services based on burden of disease and cost effectiveness analysis. And then from another university in Indonesia with the real card carrying economists, they come in and say, it's easy. We'll just fund all the hospitalizations. Insurance is really about insurance and protecting financial catastrophe. So here you, you sort of say, administrative ease, really, it's very hard, and I'll show it to you. Uh, let me go to the final point first. And the problem when we identify specific services is what do you do with the patient who is not yet differentiated, okay? And let me just show you what that means. So this is administrative ease. These are the countries. This is what they cover, okay? And this is what they, the, the share of the costs. Okay, so we need to think about a health insurance agency in a developing country and what will make it easy, easier for them to start these administrative arrangements. Let us not overwhelm them because that will defeat our purpose. Okay, and then the final thing, as I said, is if you look at health expenditures in Sri Lanka, this, this is still the same, is essentially about 20% of total health expenditure is really undifferentiated. So if we have a set of services which are defined by disease and by intervention, what will we offer these patients who come because they have a headache, et cetera, et cetera? What do we do with them? Okay, so we need to think really um, 
when, when we think about these very important considerations of ethics, fairness, and equity, that we should really think also, how do we translate it into uh, policy-relevant concerns that they can deal with and actually implement and operationalize on the ground? And this is just my last slide. I don't want to talk about it, but just to say that the cube was there in uh, WDR 1993, I checked with Dean, he said it wasn't actually there, but in one of the papers from that. So this is the cube, and it was 1993. So let's move on. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have the pleasure of introducing, he is a philosopher at Oxford uh, who specializes in both practical and theoretical ethics. And I think the practical part is um, Toby, he, with his strong interest in global poverty, has put together and founded an organization called Giving What We Can. And quite impressively, he's already has 300 members. And the idea is that people need to pledge 10% of their lifelong earnings. And up to now, he, uh, this organization has been able to raise over $100 million. Okay, so, we'll, we'll just go no, with no, it. No, no, we will try something else. Okay. Uh, have a look. Uh, oh, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be fine. Okay, uh, we have no title uh, here, but that's fine. Um, so, uh, uh, let, let's start off. We've got the, uh, the cube again here. You, you, you know what uh, key services are. Uh, this is the idea of um, how do we move uh, backwards uh, in this cube? How do we uh, define which services are going to be covered? Uh, which is the purpose of these three talks. And I think Tessa has, uh, has talked about that quite well. Uh, and uh, with the, the general cube model, I think one of the questions we're trying to ask, uh, or, or to answer really, is uh, in how do we prioritize moving upwards or leftwards or backwards in the cube, but also within each of those dimensions, uh, exactly how do we do it? Not just how do we trade off those three uh, between them, but also within each one. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, how we make trade-offs as we try to include key services and choose what package of key services to use. Uh, and I, I, I'll skip this for time. Uh, so the basic idea we're working with here is that we want to select uh, some key services and we could divide these into two categories of the high priority services. Uh, so these are the services that we want to add as soon as possible. Uh, and then the, uh, the normal priority services, uh, which we would like to add uh, to the package, but that can take a little bit longer and we should put them in second. Uh, and then the, the uh, services which are not going to be prioritized uh, because they're perhaps uh, too expensive uh, for the benefit they provide. Now, what I want to be mainly talking about is, uh, is cost effectiveness and say a few things about that and why it's really important uh, in this question. So it does sound boring. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of exactly what it is, but just to be clear, um, uh, the word effectiveness here means health benefit. Um, so the, the benefit in terms of welfare uh, of increasing people's health. Okay, so that's obviously very important to health systems is increasing people's health. Um, and the word cost is not making a trade-off between, uh, between uh, kind of sacred values and non-sacred values or something like that. It's just saying that there's a fixed amount of resources, and so we're trying to work out how to get the most health uh, given the budget. It's not actually uh, an area which is concerned with how large the budget should be. That's decided elsewhere. Uh, cost effectiveness uh, is just saying for a given budget, how do we actually produce the largest amount of health benefit? And so when you put it like that, uh, I think it's, it's clear to see that it, that it should be a major part of prioritization um, and working out what the set of key services are because it's basically just saying how do we get health. Um, uh, in fact, I think if it had just been labeled instead of cost effectiveness as uh, producing health, uh, then it would be a lot more obvious that it should be at the, the core of thinking about this. Uh, we typically measure it in DALI's disability adjusted life years. I think most of you know what they are. Uh, so 
what I really want to stress is that some interventions produce uh, much more health benefit for a given budget. Uh, when I originally looked at this, I would have assumed that some were 10% better than others or 50% better than others. Uh, maybe some were even twice as good as others in some, some cases. Uh, but actually, it's more like some, uh, some interventions in health can be hundreds or thousands of times more effective than others. And that's actually pretty common. It's not actually a, a highly unusual situation. Uh, and I don't think that cost effectiveness is the only question when it comes to priority setting and choosing the key services, but I think it should be the, the basis for it. And I'll try to explain at the end how we could fit in other things, and then Ulla will, uh, will take that up. Here is another blank slide. Okay, that. Okay, well. Mm. Uh, so I have a very impressive chart here, uh, which sadly you can't see. Uh, Ulla, however, I happen to know, has a very similar looking chart in his talk. Um, uh, so uh, what I want to be showing uh, is that uh, the, uh, there's the very uh, radical differences in uh, cost effectiveness, and I've summarized them here, though. Uh, so what you get is that if you look at the distribution of different health, so health benefits, uh, some of them uh, would produce a very short line. They, they don't produce much benefit for a given amount of money. Other ones produce huge amount of uh, and you end up with this very skewed curve. Uh, and if you look at this data, uh, which is very visually impressive, I, I assure you, uh, uh, the, the top 20% of these uh, would produce 80% of the value if you funded them equally, because it's such a skewed distribution. Uh, other facts about this distribution, the most effective intervention is 10,000 times more effective than the least effective intervention. Uh, so, and that's not just because there are a couple of extreme outliers. The least effective interventions are effective enough that they'll be funded under the NHS uh, in Britain, um, and the other ones are 10,000 times more effective than the marginal health spending in the NHS, uh, uh, which is interesting as a uh, developed world, developing world uh, comparison. Uh, and uh, the best intervention uh, in the set of data, uh, which was from the DCP2, uh, and is very similar to the, the choice data in this respect, uh, the set of data, the best intervention is 100 times more effective than the median intervention. Uh, and uh, a statistic I worked out on the, the plane over here, uh, if you choose two interventions at random from this set of 100 different health interventions which were studied, uh, on average the better one is 100 times better than the, the le less good one. Uh, so that, that is really quite striking. Uh, what does this mean and how important is this? Uh, well, prioritizing on cost effectiveness is the difference between saving a life and saving 100 lives. Um, because if you see, if you take two interventions at random and you don't prioritize on cost effectiveness, uh, often we implicitly do it, even if we don't explicitly do it. But if you didn't do it at all, uh, then on average, if you pick into interventions and you fund one um, just independently of this, uh, then you lose 99% of the value uh, that you would be producing uh, in terms of the health. Uh, so this is, this is hugely important. Uh, it's, uh, philosophers would see this as letting 100 die to save one, uh, which is not normally considered to be good. Uh, and I think it's a case also, in, in a lot of cases, people aren't aware of this, and there's a case of not seeing the forest for the trees. I think there are a lot of other issues in priority setting uh, for global health. Um, and the other issues are, are really quite interesting. Uh, but this is, if we're not even getting this right, if we're just letting kind of 99% of the health benefit go in some cases uh, on the margins. I mean, in this case of the, these interventions where the, the best one I said was 10,000 times more effective than the, the least effective, um, we're still funding the least effective one in various cases. Um, uh, so we are really, you know, in that case, losing 99.99% of the value that that money could have produced in terms of health. Uh, so uh, you could also see this as squandering 99% of the value we could produce, as wasting public funds, uh, as, and as unfairly privileging the few at the expense of the many. Uh, and in a lot of cases, also helping the rich or powerful at the expense of the poor. Um, because it's, uh, it, here's an example. If we spend a million uh, dollars on dialysis instead of on uh, tuberculosis treatment, uh, then what we would get for that is 20 years of life uh, for some at the expense of what we could have got, which is 20,000 years of life uh, for others. And the others are fairly systematically uh, the poor uh, because they're the ones who can't afford these very cheap and very effective, uh, you know, cost-effective treatments. Uh, so the vocal or more powerful who militate for, for some of these other things uh, uh, get their way at the expense of the poor uh, is a systematic effect in this. It's not merely a case of efficiency versus equity. This, this does often include both. Uh, I think, and uh, I've said elsewhere, that this is actually the biggest moral issue in global health. Um, uh, it's not the most exciting, uh, definitely, 
Uh, it's not the most philosophically interesting. It's a bit of a no-brainer, actually, that you should be trying to improve this. It's not quite clear how to trade it off against other things, but it's a no-brainer that we should be doing it in the first place. Um, it's not the most technically interesting or challenging, uh, but I think it's the core of the issue uh, is actually let's produce large amounts of health benefit instead of small amounts. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I say there, uh, and it should be the starting point for our priority setting. And some more missing slides. Okay, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but uh, thank you. Um, uh, but what I wanted to say, uh, well, hmm, maybe I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get something to work and just show a couple of things at the end of this, uh, as my summary slides actually do require diagrams as well. So uh, we'll uh, pass on to, uh, to Ulla for now. We're behind and according to Indian timing, it's pretty good. <laughs> so, um, because, so I know last, the last speaker before we go into uh, discussion is Ulla Fritav Norheim. He's a physician, both once again a combination of an academic and a uh, clinical specialist in internal medicine. Uh, but he also has and has been working for some time doing some quite a lot of work in Ethiopia, uh, so on the ground. Um, he's also uh, the International Society, he's a president for the International Society for Priorities in Health in Healthcare and is a visiting scientist and very familiar to people here at Harvard. So thank you. Thank you. So if I can start with uh, one organizational matter, I suggest that we continue until 7 o'clock, uh, if that's okay. And then we will have time both for a few of these elegant uh, slides of Toby and the philosophers that can uh, help us illuminate these questions. So what I will do is to continue where, where Toby uh, sort of stopped and uh, ask uh, or talk about cost effectiveness, financial protection, and priority to the worst off. And ask this key question, should financial protection and distributional concerns be incorporated into the decision rules for publicly financed health services? And I think this is crucial for the work uh, we are also doing on developing uh, guidance for countries that want to move towards uh, universal coverage. So I think this is a key issue, that universal coverage can be defined as access to key health services for all at an affordable cost, and that we need to, and that countries need to define key services, as Toby also said. And as you know, uh, uh, one proposal is to do that by ranking services according to cost effectiveness. And I've, to illustrate this, I've uh, selected uh, 65 uh, interventions from the WHO choice database, both on infectious diseases, childhood diseases, and non-communicable diseases. And just showing the same point as Toby showed, that there are huge differences in the amount of health you can get for the same amount of dollars. And being a little bit specific, and here it becomes very interesting, I think, because cost effectiveness is not only about interventions, single interventions, they have been put together into meaningful clinical packages uh, that respect the continuity of care. And as you can see, these are uh, key services for a healthcare system, like testing and treatment for tuberculosis, malaria, all prevention and treatment interventions, etc. And when you uh, look at this here, you get a very clear sense of how you could rank these services. And the database is much larger, larger than this. I've just taken a selection so that you can see the examples. So there are two problems with ranking only according to cost effectiveness. And it ignores financial risk protection and it ignores the distribution of healthy life years. This is familiar to many of you. And I've just... Uh, tried to grapple with this issue about financial risk protection. Should it be incorporated in uh, our thinking about adjusting ranking by cost effectiveness? And Peter Smith often said that the idea of a publicly financed healthcare system is to protect against financial protection. It's not about health or only secondly about health. 
How important is this idea? So Peter Smith has a very good paper where he discussed this. And he says that in systems where you have perfect markets also, or no one buys supplementary services, uh, service selection in the basic package could be according to cost effectiveness and a voluntary supplementary package should also be according to cost effectiveness ratios that will maximize welfare health uh, and income but if as we have in many low and middle income countries there is not such a a market for health insurance but we have a lot of out of pocket expenditures then we have to think differently uh, and he suggests that high-cost services may be favored over low-cost services, at least among services with similar cost-effectiveness ratios. So if you have a service that is not cost-effective enough to get into the basic package, but the cost is high, uh, then you might consider it when you compare it with another equally cost-effective uh, service if the cost, uh, if the depending on the cost-effectiveness ratio. So uh, my interpretation uh, of this is that financial risk protection could act at least as a tiebreaker for services with identical cost-effectiveness ratios. I see a lot of problems with uh, always including high-cost services into the basic package, of course, but I think this is uh, one interesting start for, for a discussion, and I'll, I recommend uh, Peter Smith's paper on this. Uh, secondly, um, the other problem, it ignores distribution of healthy life years. And many philosophers, ethicists, and clinical doctors have been concerned about cost effectiveness, that it produces rankings that are sometimes counterintuitive. So if we ask who are the worst off in, in health terms, if we can provide an equally large benefit for two patient groups uh, with condition A or condition B, uh, so some people have lived for 60 good life years and some have only had 25 and you could provide a benefit of let's say 20 life years. Cardiovascular disease intervention could be one uh, example. Some think that we should give some. We don't, we don't agree on how much priority to those who have had fewer life years, but we should give some additional weight to those who have had less compared to those who have had many healthy life years. So that's the simple idea of giving some priority to the worse off. And that is not incorporated according to many critics of uh, cost effectiveness analysis. So if we take this example again and applying a kind of Atkinson social welfare function as uh, Matt Adler, Adler has uh, worked a lot on and I'm sure you will talk about this later. If we compare these, these allocations in these two, uh, two groups. So we would say that the, the allocation giving priority to condition B, so s providing that and not for, for group A, the distribution 60-45 would be seen as better than 80-25. It's, it's better in terms of, of uh, life expectancy and the distribution is more equal. Another much simpler way of doing this is just to, to as health prioritarians would, assign a higher weight to benefits for B. And that's what I will propose that we could do now just to illustrate this point. Uh, and do we have any evidence on who are the worst off? And interestingly, um, the Global Burden of Disease study that was published recently, if you look at the data, and I've calculated from those data, the simple idea that those who die early on, they will lose a lot of life years. So from this list that contains more than 200 uh, uh, disease conditions, you can easily see here that from on the top here, uh, uh, babies dying of sepsis will lose 86 life years, while patients at the bottom here, hypertensive heart disease, diabetes mellitus, they lose a lot if they die, up 20 years. Uh, but compared to uh, those on the top, they, they are quite different. So if we just do this very simple division and weighing that we say that those who lose most life years if they die uh, get a weight of two. Uh, those with uh, the smallest, it's still significant of course, but with the smallest uh, loss is weighed at, uh, with, uh, 
with the weight of, of one. And we can just add this into uh, the incremental cost effectiveness uh, ratios. And that is the most simple way to do it. I think we, should, we would need to do it much more sophisticated, but just to illustrate the point. Uh, we go back to the standard cost effectiveness uh, ratio going, and, and we see when we just add these weights, we see that for many of these interventions, it makes no difference. But for some of them, uh, it makes a difference. And that's what uh, would be really interesting to look more uh, deeply in, into. And going back to the list of interventions, if you look at number four from the top, that's medical treatment, uh, beta blockers, uh, other treatments for acute uh, heart attacks and stroke, and also including primary prevention of these conditions, the non-communicable diseases that haven't been given priority so far in many low-income countries. Should we give them high priority? Yes, according to cost effectiveness. If we add uh, these priority weights or distributive weights, the rank order would shift a little bit. So we see that uh, malaria would be weighed, weighed more uh, and uh, treatment and, and prevention of cardiovascular disease will not uh, be ranked as high uh, according to this distributive weighing. And if we look at the change in rank ordering, we see that surgery to prevent blindness uh, is ranked a little bit lower if we include distributive weights. Uh, and we also see that uh, oral rehydration therapy, case management of pneumonia, etc., will be ranked a little bit higher and medical treatment for stroke and heart attack a little bit lower. And I think if we do this systematically, we could uh, incorporate distributive concerns. And we, of course, we have to discuss how much weight and we have to do it much more sophisticatedly than I've done here. But it's, uh, I present it here as a reminder that it would be possible to uh, incorporate weights and that they would give results that I find clinically quite intuitive. Uh, it's, it's nothing that, that surprised me in, in this kind of ranking, I would say. Uh, if we also think about opportunity cost, as Tessa uh, showed, we can also show it, of course, in, in this uh, framework, which is very similar, uh, that for if you have a, a budget uh, a constraint of five million, you would by ranking by standard incremental cost effectiveness have this amount of dollars averted. If you rank by uh, distributive weighted uh, uh, dollars, you lose some. Uh, and the difference will be uh, about this for within this uh, uh, budget limitation. So it's an easy way to show that incorporating some uh, extra weight to the worse off will have some uh, opportunity cost. And we can use that to explicitly discuss our weights and the ranking and our priorities. So just to conclude, uh, this is very rough of course, but if we go back to Toby's scheme of these key services and the high priority and normal priority services, uh, I think many would agree that we could define these key services by first cost effectiveness, starting there. And I would say as an ethicist, it would be unethical not to consider cost effectiveness for exactly the, the reasons that Toby, man, Toby mentioned. Then I would suggest that we would have to incorporate some considerations of uh, distribution, uh, and especially in this dimension on services, the distribution of healthy life years or do dollars. And then we need to add some consideration of financial risk protection, whether either as a tiebreaker or maybe uh, in a more systematic fashion. And I think we have just started thinking about this, is, this uh, issue here. Having this very rough scheme, of course, we need a lot of evidence and we need to interpret this evidence and we need to make value judgments. And I think for countries who will decide on what should be their core services, I think we also need then procedures, as, as Norman has argued, that we have to balance these considerations. And there are other considerations that we haven't mentioned here. Uh, the evidence, the quality of the evidence, the strength of the evidence. So there are a lot of concerns we need, but I think these are three uh, key dimensions that we need to consider.
Yeah, okay. Uh, so here are just a, a few examples of uh, some of the cost effectiveness uh, data from DCP2. Uh, comparing the effectiveness of uh, treatment for Carposi sarcoma with uh, ART. So this is 2005 data, I think. So uh, they'll be more cost effective than that now. I don't know the, the current uh, details. This is just for reference is, the, is how effective it needs to be in, uh, in the UK to be funded, uh, 20,000 pounds per DALI. Uh, and as you can see, uh, ART is uh, much more effective than it would need to be. Treatment for Carposi sarcoma is about on the, on the threshold. Uh, but if we zoom out, you can see uh, prevention of transmission during pregnancy is much more effective again. Uh, we can't even see this threshold of how effective it needs to be to be funded in Britain anymore. Uh, we can zoom out again. Distribution for condoms is much more effective. We can zoom out again. Um, and now we're into malaria here. Uh, distribution of bed nets is much more effective again. Uh, the complete distribution from, uh, from that data looks like this, as I was saying. These things are just not very effective uh, compared to these things here. And if you're missing funding some of these, uh, and instead to focus on a couple of those, uh, then that's the case of uh, missing the forest for the trees. Uh, and uh, then I also want to mention, uh, here are some of the other concerns that the report uh, GPS Health uh, mentions that people might want to consider in addition to cost effectiveness. Uh, and one could look at those in some detail. Um, they're very difficult to quantify and very difficult to weigh against each other. And uh, the authors of that report don't know how to weigh them against each other. No one really does. Uh, what I would suggest as a mechanism uh, is just here. So I want to say this is a, very, a basic approach you could use uh, where you say, uh, I've now inverted this scale. So it's, it's how much a, a DALI costs um, where you want to be very cheap instead of the previous bars you wanted longer to be better. Um, in this case, you could say the most effective things, we'll put them in the, uh, the highly effective category, then have the middle category, then the non-effective category that we don't fund. This is in multiples of gross national income per capita, um, so it's a sliding scale that, that moves with the country's uh, resource constraints. You could use something else as well, uh, maybe to do with the actual size of the health budget there instead of uh, the size of their economy. Uh, maybe that's a better way. Uh, but what, what they do in, uh, in the NHS uh, with NICE is they have an overlap zone, um, which is between about one times uh, gross national income per capita and one and a half times. Uh, and if it's in the middle, if it's in that area, uh, then we look at additional uh, considerations to work out whether to fund. Uh, this is for new pharmaceuticals. And so I would suggest a similar thing with actually potentially quite large overlaps between the categories, uh, such that you start with cost effectiveness as the basis of what you're looking at, um, i.e. producing more health for the public. Uh, and then uh, if, say, it's a, if it's here, uh, then you consider uh, additional details to work out whether it goes into the green category or into the yellow category. Um, and so this is a, a quantitative approach to that. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's all of my normal talk. I can just say this is the thing we looked at uh, yesterday on a financial burden as to how you compare that. And you can see here that uh, if you were just considering uh, the axis of health benefit, these would be lines of equal value. And you know, this thing would be much better than that thing because this is moving more effectively across here. Um, what you can do if you want to weigh those two things in at different rates is use diagonal lines instead. Um, and uh, uh, economists would call these indifference curves. And uh, you could set that up and, uh, and look at those. Uh, if you want to uh, ask the question, how do you compare them? That's the question about the different slope of this line. And then uh, uh, if you want a slope of the line such that it would actually change the order, in the case of uh, uh, Chalani's uh, example, the slope would have to be like this. And if you look at what that is, um, it's equivalent to here. And that's saying 1,000 deaths averted is equally good as avoiding $50,000 of uh, financial risk protection or as, as achieving that, which is, means that one death averted is the same as avoiding $50 of uh, this, and that seems to be a pretty implausible ratio, and therefore it would turn out they have to be steeper than this, and you would get the, uh, the other result. And you can do some similar things with, uh, with what Dean had. Um, here is, if you compare, if you think one person being pushed into poverty is equally bad to a person dying, uh, you'd get things as steep as this, um, which get quite close to being the vertical case. Um, and if you think that it's uh, maybe the ratio is, is more like two or three or ten or something, you get even steeper ones, and it gets even more like just the normal case. So I just wanted to explain that as well. Um, but uh, thanks.